good to gather as we see the fields ripe for the harvest around us. We're reminded, as Jesus said, we look around at the people around us and realize the fields are ripe for the harvest as well. And we gather to remember just what it is we have to share, what it is we have to tell, the hope that we have. I was sure that was on. <laughs> Maybe I held the button too long, though. So, um, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that we're having um, an in-kind school supply offering also during this service. And for those of you who brought something, if you could get your bags to the ends of the aisles, the children are going to pick them up and bring them forward during... The, during the hymn before the children's message. And if you forgot and would like to give something, one option you have is Joshua Christian Academy. They have an Amazon wish list, which if you search for it, they have a list of supplies for their school that they're hoping, and you can order that and it'll ship straight to the school if you, you missed something and would like still to give something to support Joshua Christian Academy's work in uh, giving Christian education to some children in Des Moines. Let's take a moment of silent prayer to quiet our hearts, to still our thoughts, and to enter into this time of worship. Let's pray. I'd like to invite you to rise for our call to worship. It's Psalm 96, verses 10 through 13. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly fixed, established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound in all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. They will sing before the Lord, for He comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people's in his truth. Amen. Let's turn in our gray hymnals to number 247 as our opening hymn. All glory be to God on high. 247. <laughs>
And our God greets you here this morning. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide in your hearts now and always. Amen. You may be seated. Jeremiah says this in chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. I know, O Lord, that a man's life is not his own. It is not for man to direct his steps. Correct me, Lord, but only with justice, not in your anger, lest you reduce me. To nothing. Let us confess our sins, inviting God to correct us, not in anger, but through the redemption of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. God Almighty, as Jeremiah reminds us, Our lives are not our own. It is not for us to direct our steps. Lord, we make plans rightly. Only when we acknowledge Lord willing. Lord, you call us to go about life. Lord willing. But so often, Lord, we want things our way and push to get it that way and forget Lord willing. Lord, have mercy us on us when we are blind in our pride to your sovereign power and your providential guiding of not just history, but also our lives. God Almighty, we pray that you would forgive us for doubts when we look at the circumstances we're in and we wonder, what on earth, why, how can I get out of this and forget or that in all things you work for the good of those who love you who have been called according to your purpose, not according to our purposes. Lord, we pray your Holy Spirit would work in us to shape and fashion us more and more in the image of Christ through your refining fire. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would continue to renovate our lives, that you would correct us with the wonder of your grace, making us new in true righteousness and holiness more and more, picking us up again as often as we stumble. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us, we pray. Amen. Hear now the good news from Jeremiah 31, verses 33 and 34. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time. And we know at this point that it's after the death of Christ declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, 
For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that is the promise that we are assured is true. That is yes and amen in Jesus Christ. So know that if you are looking to Christ in repentance and faith, that all your sins are washed away. And that you have been set free from the tyranny of the devil. And God's people said, thanks be to God. Amen. As God's forgiven children with the law written on our hearts and our minds, hear now his will for our lives as a people who are waiting for Christ's return. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Amen. So just a reminder, children, as you come forward for the children's message, please collect any bags and bring them. We'll set them up here on the head corners of the off steps. So as we prepare to come to God's word, I invite you to turn in your gray hymnals to 566. In you is gladness. 566. <laughs>
In our Bible passage today, we're talking about when Jesus comes back. Now, I have a question here. Now, I look in this bag here, and I see some sterilizing wipes. <gasps> Play-Doh. Some more hand sanitizer wipes. I see a lot of pencil crayons here and some markers and some regular pencils. What do ordinary things like this have to do with Jesus coming back? Do they have anything to do with Jesus coming back? Not really? Well, actually, Jesus says they do. How does that work? In our Bible passage, Jesus tells us two things. He says, one, I'm coming back. And two, you don't know when. <laughs> and so what do we do with that? Jesus tells us what to do with those two things. He tells a story about a servant who's been given a job and his master goes away. And what's a servant supposed to do after his master leaves? He's supposed to do the job he was given and wait for the master to come back. He doesn't know when his master's coming back, but he's supposed to do his job. Well, some of you are in school now. What's your job? To learn. To learn. Yeah, you learn in school, but you learn out of school. Part of a job of a student is to learn. And that's part of what you're supposed to be doing to be ready when Jesus comes back. Trusting in Jesus as your Savior, but then doing what is in front of you. We look around the fields, and Jesus says there's going to be people in the fields when he returns, combining. Well, he didn't use the word combining, but there's going to be people in the fields picking corn, maybe, somewhere in this world when Jesus comes back. And that's part of what they're doing, to be ready for Jesus to come back. Trusting that Jesus is their Lord and Savior and doing the job that God has given them. Or think of the moms and dads in the congregation. Part of what they're supposed to be doing to be ready is trusting in Jesus, like everybody else, and taking care of their kids and teaching them how to trust in Jesus also. So we know that Jesus is coming back and we don't know when. But we know this. We're called to trust in him and do our ordinary work of loving people and trying to share Jesus. Just like these gifts are a way for us to love the students at Joshua Christian Academy in Des Moines. And a lot of those students don't come from Christian families. Their teachers are the ones telling them about Jesus. And these school supplies help them know that not just their teachers love them, but we do too because we love Jesus. And Jesus calls us to help other people. And so let's pray and then we're going to read the Bible and listen to God speak. God, our Heavenly Father, this is your word and we are your sheep. Please feed your sheep with your word and glorify your name. In Christ we pray. Amen. You can go back again. I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. We're going to look at the verses 36 through 51. The end of the chapter of Matthew 24. The grass withers and the flowers fall. The word of our God endures forever. Matthew 24, starting at verse 36. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. From the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. 
and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day the, your, your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth. He'll put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, My master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him And an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What can we know? If you look for them, you can find prophecy conferences all over the place telling you just how certain current events are fulfilling biblical prophecies of old and how now is the time. Decades ago, you remember the series of books, Left Behind, speculating about how exactly the end would come. What does the Bible say? What will it look like? Well, we're going to look. What does the Bible say this morning in this passage? And we'll connect to one or two others. But what we find is knowledge is to be expected and ignorance is to be expected. And Jesus starts by stating that in verse 36 with ignorance. What can you expect to know about the end time? No one knows about that day or hour. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Now we have to pause and just clarify, how is it that Jesus, who is God, cannot know the time when the Father knows? And what we see here in this statement is just part of what Jesus took on himself when he took on human flesh. As Paul puts it in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Or as some other translations put it, he emptied himself. Taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. Even death on a cross. What we find in scripture is that Jesus is truly God. With all the authority and power of God. 
At the same time here in the incarnation, he is truly man. He was a baby who had to learn to walk. He didn't know that when he was born. He had to learn to talk. He cooed just like any other baby, cried to make his needs known. He learned as he grew physically. And part of this being human, submitting himself to our humanity that he might be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in our place, was to experience what we do as well in not necessarily knowing everything. We have other glimpses in the Gospels where Jesus knows what's in their heart even though they don't say it. But there are other areas where as a man, Jesus doesn't know everything that he knows as the Son of God eternal. And the church has always wrestled with how, what exactly does that look like, but we know it's true. But Jesus' point in this, you will not know, I do not know, is this. We don't need to know everything in order to be saved. You could say this is a, a, a reminder of the sufficiency of Scripture. The scriptures, as the Belgic Confession say, contain everything we need for salvation. But at the same time, we find they're not an encyclopedia that contains knowledge about every single subject to which we want the answers to. So while we as Christians can have certainty about the central topics of the faith. About Jesus being God and man. About Jesus atoning death on the cross. Propitiating our sins. Taking away God's wrath against us. End time knowledge with a specific date isn't in there. So you could say, as one commentator put it, the true orthodox position on end times is sanctified ignorance. Or as Jesus put it, no one knows the date or the hour. Or as he says in Acts chapter 1, 17, when the disciples come to him saying, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel this time? He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. But what we do know is this. We know what is going to happen. Jesus just told us previously in verses 29 through 31. That he's going to return on the clouds with the trumpet call of God and no one will miss it. It will be absolutely clear to the world that he's come back. We can know he is coming back. What we do not know is when it's going to happen. No one knows the day or the hour. And so then Jesus moves on here to say, keep watch, be ready. He points to the days of Noah. As Noah's going around building the ark, and he was building that ark for hundred years. People had the opportunity to see what's he doing and ask. And what did they do? Well, they went about ordinary life. They weren't expecting a flood. They didn't think one was coming. And boom, it came. They were surprised. We as believers know that Jesus is coming again. But what Jesus wants us to guard against here is forgetting that he's coming. Or just letting it drift so far to the back burner that we're not aware of it in our day-to-day -day lives. 
Because sometimes when we're thinking about these end times, when Jesus comes again, we're, we're thinking there's going to be warning. We're going to see the tribulations coming. But in a certain way, that we are already in the great tribulations. Jesus talked about all the persecution and wars and nation rising up against nation and false prophets and deceivers in the first part of this chapter. But that all goes on as in the days of Noah when everything seems to be going on as it did before. The time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming, the time the church is called to go forth with the Great Commission, will look very ordinary. We see that here in this passage. We have men out in the fields. We have marriages. We have eating and drinking. We have women milling the grain. And in the midst of all that, Christ comes back. And we see this division that happens. Two men are in the field. One's taken, the other left. Two women. One's taken, the other's left at the mill. In Luke, there's two people in bed. One's taken, the other's left. So what we need to guard against and what the world's problem is that we kind of see here that isn't necessarily incredibly sin, great sin, but rather the secular indifference. It's the, God's not coming, go about your own business. That's part of what we need to guard against so that we are ready when Christ comes again. Because when he comes again, there's going to be this division. Now, we have this language of one taken and the other left. And this is sometimes being understood in connection with that, that rapture of the people. And what we have to say is the rapture that comes from the Latin word rapier, which is connected to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'd invite you to turn there. Keep a finger in the Matthew 25 passage. But Matt, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17. And verse 16 in Thessalonians talks about just about what Jesus has said earlier in Matthew 24. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That word caught up is that Latin word rapier, where rapture comes from. And the last verse there is, or last line is, and so we will be with the Lord forever. There is a, a catching up, a snatching. Well, we have to look at what is the context in Matthew 25 of this taking away. Well, the first taking away, you go to verse 30, 39, and we have the flood taking people away. So Noah and his family are in the ark and everyone else is taken away. So perhaps this taking away is the ones left behind are the saved. Like Noah was left behind on the ark. But if we go a little bit further back to verse 31 in Matthew 25, we find him sending his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. So maybe that's the taking away. And I think that is in connection with 1 Thessalonians 4. There's the people, the Christians are, are taken, as 1 Thessalonians 14, 4.17 says, 
to meet with the Lord in the air. Now, where we have some differences with our our dispensational brothers and sisters in Christ is understanding what happens after we're taken. Because often they, they argue that that happens before the tribulation and then there's seven years of tribulation and then Christ comes back with his people. But if we look at 1 Thessalonians 4.17, that word, those believers are caught up together with the, the dead in Christ who've been raised in the clouds to meet the Lord. Now that word meet, in English we just think, okay, you get together. But that Greek, the Greek word for meeting is only used three times in the New Testament. And it's not a normal meeting. We find it actually in Matthew 25, in the parable of the ten virgins. It's verse 6. The, the announcement goes out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Well, the guests are coming out to meet the bridegroom and go where he's going. Another place we find it is in Acts chapter 28, verse 15. Remember, Paul is on his journey to Rome, and the Roman Christians catch wind that Paul's on his way, and they come to meet him. Well, 60, 80 miles from Rome and escort him back to Rome where he was going. And in the secular Greek, this word for meeting was where a delegation of the local authorities would go out to greet a coming dignitary. So if the Roman emperor was going to go to Philippi, the Philippian mayor and all the, the hot shots of the city would go out of the city a couple miles to meet the emperor and escort him in to show that we're with him. And that's the kind of meeting that Paul says is going to happen when we are caught up to Jesus in the clouds. And those left behind will see that we were wrong. <laughs> And Jesus is who he says he is. And all those people whom we persecuted and said were fools and idiots are with him as he comes to establish his kingdom in victory. The people in the fields, those caught up, are going to meet Jesus in the sky. And escort him back as he comes to judge the living and the dead and make all things new. And so the question Jesus says is, our time? When that winnowing comes and one is taken up and the other left behind, are you going to be taken up to be part of that delegation escorting Jesus as the victorious king? Into his kingdom. Or are you going to find yourself weeping and gnashing your teeth? To use the language of verse 51 in this chapter. We as Christians know that Jesus is coming. We do not know when he is coming. And so Jesus says keep watch. He uses that example of this, if a house owner knows a burglar is coming during this night, they're going to not go to sleep. They're going to guard their house all night long to keep that burglar from coming in. And Jesus says, now is the hour. Our lives sometimes don't feel that urgency. As we rightly go about our day-to-day -day lives, farming and school and work and play, family and sickness and health. But Jesus is through it all, be on your guard. Be on your toes, so to speak. Because here's the truth. You're going to be surprised when he comes back. But you can be ready. 
The unbelievers in the world will be surprised also and they won't be ready. So live with the knowledge of Christ's return always in your mind. Always ready for his return. This is the added benefit that you're always ready to die. Because we never know when we're going to die. We can just have a heart attack and drop dead right here in this worship service. We could get T-boned as we're driving home from church. But we're called to be ready by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. And then whether we die or he returns, we'll be surprised. But we won't be taken by surprise. We'll be ready. Jesus closes this section here in this chapter with, with this contrast between these two servants in verse 45 through 51. And I titled this section, Don't Fool Yourself. Because as we look at these two servants, we get the impression that they both think they're Christian. They've both been given a job by their master. The first servant does it faithfully and is rewarded for that. But look at the second servant there in verse 48. He says, suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master. He acknowledges that the Lord is his master. And he ends up there in verse 51, assigned a place with the hypocrites. He's fooled himself into thinking, I'm a believer, I'm good. But Jesus isn't coming back. I don't need to be ready right now. I can live the way I want to live. And so we're given this challenge. Be like the faithful servant. And what's the task that Jesus gives as an example here of being faithful? Giving them their food at the proper time. Waiting on tables. So we're called to those ordinary lives we're in and to be faithful in the midst of them as we wait. Be faithful in our meetings at work. Be faithful going to school, as I told the kids, and learning, whether in school or out. Being faithful as friends, as husband and wives, as families. Being faithful as a pastor. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Called to hold forth the word clearly. But Jesus ends this talk on a note of warning. Jesus is coming again, brothers and sisters. Jesus is coming again, those of you who have not professed your faith in Jesus Christ. He says, be ready. Be expectant. I'd like to close by reading a few verses that Paul wrote to Titus. Titus chapter 2. Verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. That 
is how we are to wait. Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you thankful that you tell us what we need to know and enable us to deal with that which we cannot know. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be ready to go about our day-to-day -day lives with our eyes fixed on Jesus and working as unto the Lord, no matter how mundane our work may seem, no matter how ordinary our lives appear, and no matter how long you seem to tarry. Hold us fast, Lord. We cannot keep ourselves ready but for your grace and your Holy Spirit continually bringing new life and reminders to us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Our song of response is one that looks to that day when Christ returns, 612, lo, he comes with clouds descending, 612.
Let us come to our God in prayer. Abba Father, we delight that you give us the privilege of calling you Abba through our adoption in the blood of Jesus Christ. We come to you thankful. Thankful for another day that you've given. Thankful for the privilege of gathering to worship with fellow believers. To sing and pray and sit under your word. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us for our pilgrim journey this morning. Lord, we give you thanks for the, the beautiful week we could have. Lord, we see the, the farmers busy in the fields harvesting. We pray for protection and safety around the large equipment and the long hours. We give you thanks for the crops that we have. Lord, you are good. Heavenly Father, we pray that um, you would guide and direct our children as they learn at school and at home and in various places under various teachers Lord guard and guide them help them to grow to know and love you and put their faith in you we pray that we would walk alongside them and disciple them well modeling what a life of faith and repentance looks like of humility and of courage in you Heavenly Father, we give you thanks with Frank and Carm for the wedding yesterday of their daughter Stephanie and Jason. Or we pray your blessing upon this couple and their marriage. That you would work in them and through them. That you would draw them close to you, we pray. To rest and rely on you for their family life. Heavenly Father, we pray for other marriages, new young marriages, marriages that are approaching 60 years. We pray for those who are grieving the death of their spouse as they think about marriage, who are yearning to be able to just sit next to them and hold their hand and talk again. God of all comfort and compassion, be near and encourage the widows. Those widowers who are, who are grieving and have a hole where they once had their living and breathing spouse. And we thank you for the hope of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. May that give us Strength for the journey to go forward. God, our Heavenly Father, we pray for our country. We pray for true justice and righteousness to be made known through the laws of the land. Lord, we grieve when the laws seem to actively work against your truth and your righteousness. We pray that we would be salt and light as we use the voices that we have, the, the, the ways, the means we do to influence our government. We pray for our president and our elected representatives, for our judges and all those in power on the, the federal and state and local levels. Lord, they need your wisdom. And they are in your hand, whether they acknowledge or not. Guide them where you will. God, our Father, we pray for your worldwide church. We pray for the, the Vanderwalls as they seek to um, finish their fundraising that they might return to Papua New Guinea. Encourage John and Trista and their girls. We pray that 
they would receive that funding soon and be able to go back to the work for Wycliffe in Papua New Guinea. We pray for the Lemahews as they are already back there in Papua New Guinea at work. Lord, guard and guide them, Doug and Benita. We pray for the Giffords, uh, Dave and Blanca and their children in, in Mexico as he seeks to teach and equip church leaders in Mexico City and around the, that country, in the Spanish-speaking world, to provide biblical resources for them. Lord, we pray for Joel and Jeannie Heiser. Joel's work is uh, around the world in various places, encouraging and equipping churches as they seek to be salt and light and work alongside other other congregations in their countries. Lord, thank, we thank you that we can be part of this. We thank you that we can be part through our, our offerings and connection to our, our denomination as well, to supporting all the missionaries that are supported through Resonate Global Mission and their work in so many different countries and languages around the world and so many other means of getting the gospel out. Lord, we, mean, we pray that that seed would not return empty, but many would come to know and love you. Heavenly Fathers, we met as churches yesterday and Friday night as class of Central Plains. We give you thanks that we could examine Dan Van Coten as a commissioned pastor. Lord, we pray you would guard and guide him and equip him for his work as a chaplain on the floor of, of Vermeer. We pray that you would use him and the other chaplains to, to be ready to explain the hope that they have to the many who do not have that hope working there. Thank you for the opportunity they have to do this. Heavenly Father, as we take our offering this morning for the Christian Education Fund, we pray for our children and those who educate them in schools and at home. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Our offering this morning is for the Christian Education Fund. We give to the God who gave us himself in Christ Jesus.
As we prepare to go out from here, I invite you to turn to 548 when we walk with the Lord. 548 in the gray. Doxology after the benediction is number 117, Psalm 117. As you go from here to love and serve the Lord, seeking to be ready for his return, go with God's blessing. May God go before you to guide you. May God go behind you to defend you. May God go beneath you to support you. May God go beside you to befriend you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and fill you with his peace in Christ. Amen.